Welcome to the What's Your Ethos podcast. Hi, I'm Peter Colas, CEO of Ethos. Today I talk with Bill Lester, the CEO of Emeritas. Emeritas is a top life insurance and financial services company serving families and businesses. We discuss the company's strategy of diversification, their focus on taking market share, and their advantages operating as a mutual company. So let's jump into it. Hi, and welcome to the What's Your Ethos podcast, where we interview the leaders from insurance carriers, distributors, and insure techs tackling some of the biggest issues in the industry. I'm Peter Colas, the CEO of Ethos, and today we have with us Bill Lester, the CEO of Emeritas. Founded in 1887, Emeritas offers a wide range of insurance and financial products and services to individuals and businesses. In 2022, Emeritas helped protect nearly 6 million people and distributed $3.2 billion of policyholder benefits. I've been lucky to get to know Bill over the last few years and learn from him, and I think he's a spectacular person and that you're going to really enjoy listening to him today. Bill, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Peter. And you just reminded me that this month, is Emeritus's 136th year anniversary. Just this month. Wow. Yeah. And if I'm correct, this year is the 30th year that you've been with Emeritus. Is that right? 39 years. Oh, 39 at the, years. Oh, at my the God. End of, end of this year in December will be 40 years, four decades. So yeah. you, you bleed Emeritus red. Very much so. Nebraska and Emeritus red. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a Nebraska native and big figure in the community, and you joined Emeritas 39 years ago. How did you initially get into the business of protecting families and join Emeritas? Yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a long story. Hopefully you'll give me a little bit of time to indulge here. Yeah. It, um, I, uh, I kind of I started out uh, at, at the undergraduate level at the University of Nebraska, majoring in, in finance, and just at the time when investment management was being kind of professionalized. So these things that we t- kind of take for granted, the CFA program and Eugene Fama with modern portfolio theory and the efficient frontier and those sort of things. We're, we're just being uh, introduced, and for some reason, it kind of clicked with me in my finance classes. So I, I kind of quickly uh, gravitated towards investment management before it was really kind of a cool thing to do. Hmm. Um, it was the 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 industry wasn't really professionalized. It was more just uh, you know stockbrokers taking orders that sort of thing and not uh, not wealth management so um, how did I get to this this opportunity well uh, when I was a freshman in college my father passed away he was 52 kind of unexpectedly but he had a hundred thousand dollar face amount insurance policy I really didn't have any idea how important that was but what it did allow uh, was for my mother to stay in her home and for me to uh, finish my undergraduate work at the University of Nebraska. And while I was doing that, I got an internship job at a local broker dealer called First Mid America, who was uh, ultimately in 1983 bought out by Payne Weber. And this is one of those uh, kind of turning points in, in a person's career. And uh, when they bought us out, they came and visited uh, with all of the associates of, of the broker dealer. There were about 150 of us at that time. And I interviewed in the research area and uh, the guy that was ahead of that said, hey, send me your resume, but make sure it's not the only place that you send your resume. And I'm like, oh my God, I think I just got fired from uh, from my job. and. That's exactly what did happen. I sent my resume to uh, to Wall Street in New York, and I sent it to a bunch of other places. And I ended up with uh, several uh, job opportunities in Des Moines at uh, kind of being a financial services hub in the Midwest. Also, Payne Weber did offer me a job. 
But at that time, remember, I said it wasn't an, an interesting or it wasn't a desired place to uh, kind of job to be in. And I could make more money in Lincoln, Nebraska, Des Moines, Iowa, um, Kansas City, Kansas, than I could in New York working on Wall Street. Now, my career might have been different on Wall Street. So I turned them down and I was trying to decide which which kind of bank trust department or insurance company broker dealer that I wanted to go to work for with the job offers that I had. And I happened to run into the uh, CEO one night at a networking dinner and uh, of a banker's life insurance company in Nebraska, which was the predecessor of Emeritus. And uh, he asked me what I was going to, what I was planning on doing. And I said, well, I don't really know but I'm interested in staying in the finance field and I've got a couple jobs, uh, Kansas City and, and Des Moines. And um, it was decent money back then. It was $35,000 was was the compensation. Um, remember this is you know 1983. And uh, so I told him what I wanted, uh, what it would take to get me to work at some place. And uh, we, we ended up uh, kind of parting ways that night. And the next morning, I got a call from from this gentleman at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. And he said, hey, Bill, why don't you come out and talk to us? We have an opportunity at the insurance company. And so you just really never know who those uh, contacts that you're you're making, where they may take you. And I said, sure. I didn't, I didn't have a clue what an insurance company really did from an investment standpoint. I didn't understand, you know, that they were investing for the long term to kind of meet the guarantees and the promises that insurance companies were making that may last a generation. But I found it fascinating. Um, I came in uh, as a, a private placement fixed income portfolio manager and quickly shifted my gears over to uh, to equity management for for Bankers Life Insurance Company in Nebraska at that time. 1983 was the start of the bull market. So I started at Emeritus at a time when they really didn't have much in the way of uh, equity investments, alternative investments. And it was the, right at the cusp of the, the, the bull market interest rates were, you could buy a, a 30 year treasury at 14%. You could buy a not an investment grade bond with the 16% yield on it. You could buy common stocks with a PE of six to eight and a dividend yield of four to five. And uh, we were under invested in, in common stocks. And that was really my first job was to build up the, the common stock portfolio. At the very pinnacle of the point when the common stock market took off because the discount rate was going to proceed proceed to decline for the next 40 years. So um, a little bit of hard work over the last I, I wish I wish years. we could go I wish we could go back to that moment just for one day so I could put it all in. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, we were so scared of putting it all in back then. But yeah. uh, we went from uh, 60% invested in our common stock portfolio to 80% and we thought we were going to blow the, the lid right off of the place. Uh, just in the oh. common stock portfolio. And we got into alternatives and all of those higher kind of total return assets at that time. So um, that's kind of the history. My uh, the, That $100,000 life insurance policy allowed my mom to stay in, uh, in her home. But she also became a student of the market. And Peter, I know you're too young for this, but her favorite show, was Wall Street Week on Friday evening uh, with Louis Rukeyser. And she became a student of the market with her $100,000 and invested in blue chip uh, dividend growing common stocks, which uh, somewhere in our family we still own today. Um, but she basically lived off of that by investing smartly in the, in the stock market. And that, that's really where I got the bug in addition to my education and as a finance major at the university. You know, it's funny. We figured out that a disproportionate number of ethos employees had lost a 
breadwinning parent early and either had life insurance and benefited from it or didn't. And either case was equally motivating to join the mission of protecting more families. So, yeah, it's impacted a lot of people's lives. Um, yeah. What, what we do and the families, there's, there's this tremendous opportunity for uh, companies like ours to fill this gap that's been created. There's been a significant decline in the percentage of families that own life insurance over the years. There's just not this feeling of responsibility that there's, there's a good backstory behind my, my father and, and my mother that uh, we moved to Lincoln in 1969 because he was a small business owner was affiliated with Ford Motor and they went on strike in 2000 or in 1968. And so he lost his business to the bank in, in uh, 69 and we moved to Lincoln, but he continued to pay the premium on his life insurance policy so that his family was protected. Hmm. Kind of incredible when they're struggling every day just yeah. to put food on the table. That was, that was an impor important uh, responsibility that he had. But we're, we're not seeing that. We saw a, a shock increase in the attitude of consumers during the pandemic. The first time in my 30 plus years of experience in the life insurance company where we had really above, above uh, GDP sort of growth in our life insurance business. Yep. People were actually calling us and wanting to buy life insurance, which is something I've never experienced. It is uh, definitely a product that, that needs to be sold and the need needs to be understood. So for the context of our listeners, most of which were in the insurance industry, but some maybe not in life insurance, you know, for decades, every year, the number of life insurance policies sold decreases, but the total premiums issued increases as more and more of the mix of policies bought are shifting to higher net worth products. Um, Bill, what do you ascribe the declining number of policies sold to? Simply just a shift in this sense of responsibility or anything else? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of kind of uh, social issues and economic issues with respect to that, that decline. You know, Emeritus uh, focuses on the the higher end of the marketplace. So in, in most economic cycles, we have really minimal impact in our activity and our growth. The face amount of our policies increases every year with the, I think the demands and needs of our, our customers. It's one of the reasons why we're, um, you know, we're working with Ethos is to expand our reach down into that middle market that, that we just cannot access with the, the distribution systems that we have today. Um, so I, th I think it's a little bit of access, which the industry is aware of and working on. I think there's um, some crowding out of priorities by consumers, but um, you know we, we don't see a decline in the understanding of the need to protect families. We just see a, a decline in the actual purchase of, of life insurance by families today. So it's a, I consider it to be a really target rich environment for life insurance today. And uh, I think we need to learn that's, you know, that's part of the change in the industry. We need to learn how to create access to the underserved populations and families that are out there. That is a growing percentage of the total. So it, if we go back to your career, you've held many leadership positions from when you joined as a securities analyst to now as the CEO of the company, but you led the investment business, you led the New York life insurance company, you became COO, et cetera. When you think about all these roles, what do you, and including your current one, where does your biggest sense of personal accomplishment 
uh, come in throughout the 39 years? Yeah, I think there's a couple of areas or a couple of things that uh, I'm pretty proud of. One is just the uh, the growth of the company over over at least the the tenure that I've had here. We've uh, we have had like a 10 percent compound annual growth rate over the 40 years, essentially. That I've Which been is extremely company. high in our industry. Extremely high, and but not all of it is organic. A large, large percentage of it was a couple of transformational mergers that that took place uh, in the early 2000 period when when there was the opportunity to to consolidate and combine mutual based organizations. Both hmm. uh, both of those mer- mergers kind of doubled the com- size of the company at hmm. each of their respective points in time. So that growth. Um, is uh, really critical to me. I think people around Emeritus get really tired of me talking about profitable growth being our kind of our number one focus. And there's a whole bunch of things behind that. But one is, you know, we, we've gone from when I started in the company, uh, about 400 associates. Today, we have about 2,400 across the country. So we're creating great jobs and great opportunities and great uh, growth opportunities for individuals when they're part of emeritus. So I'm very proud of that. I kind of often think about the weight of, so 2,400 times the multiplier of an average family size time, times the kind of their extended families and the implications of that. And I think about, oh man, I kind of have uh, the responsibility of a number of people that can fill up Memorial Stadium Stadium on a football Saturday, which is about <laughs> 85,000 people. Uh, but um, kind of, I'm okay with that because I know that uh, we're a strong and stable organization. So I'm very proud of that. And then the other uh, thing that I'm very proud of, and we, we talk about these stories with our customers, you know, we're there when our customers need us in times of stress, when they're having a bad day. Those you know, t- you talked about the billions of dollars of benefits that we pay out on a daily basis. It might be a death benefit, might be a individual disability income benefit, uh, but we're there when they need us, and that's we we take that very personal at Emeritus that we need to be able to deliver on the promises that our distribution partners are making on a daily basis. But there's also the good times, right? We're in retirement. Uh, Planning, retirement income planning. We're uh, we're in investments through our broker dealer and registered investment advisor. Uh, we're we're in individual annuities. We're in group annuities through 401k plans, 457 plans, uh, multiple employer plan products, that sort of thing. So every day we're sending out a check uh, checks for families to enjoy their retirement and. So I'm very proud of that as well. So these billions of dollars that uh, that we send out continues to grow and uh, continues to our tagline is fulfilling life. And I, I truly believe that we fulfill uh, many, many lives out there in, in good times and in bad times, but we're there. We're there when they need us the most. And in the 39 years, what were some of the most insurmountable obstacles or challenging environments that you had to process through? Well, I think um, I mentioned the two transformational mergers that we went through. Uh, Acquisitions are are difficult and uh, there's, you know, all all the social issues and all the, all kind of all the business issues that are, uh, part of those. And so, you know, in the end, I think Emeritus had the had the capital to be the surviving entity in in the combinations. And that's probably the appropriate place for uh for the survivor to one that has the foundation of stability and strength. But uh, a lot of tough decisions in in that I was the chief investment officer during during both of those transfer rate, mergers, we had to make a lot of decisions about 
how to combine portfolios, how to uh, create uh, parity and, and fairness between uh, customers and policyholders, and then the, the individual personnel decisions that needed to be made. On top of, you know, what is the longer term uh, strategic intent of the organization? So those are those are probably the most difficult periods of time. We have uh, the 2008, 2009 financial crisis was right after the second transformational merger. And uh, like everyone during those times, as things were melting down, we had to uh, we had to get a really good handle. We kind of did the first stress testing during that period. That created the the wow scenarios, the worst of the worst scenarios, to yep. make sure that the company would not have any issues surviving uh, the the financial meltdown at that point. So that was stress, very stressful. Um, but there wasn't anything in the the wow scenarios that indicated that Emeritus wouldn't survive longer term. And we try and like, like Warren Buffett does, we try and look at those opportunities or those periods as opportunities to, to grow and create stability for, for other organizations at the, at the same time. We are a bit of a serial acquirer over time and, uh, use that to bring in people and scale and technology and, and products that we don't have. So there were so, a few acquisitions after that. So Emeritus is very diversified, but and is in many, you know, too many products and, and businesses to talk about, but what are some of your really core products and markets where you're very dominant in and have really invested a lot in? Yeah. The, um, so there's a re there's a purpose for the diversification. It's a big part of our strategy. We're we're diversified in in businesses. So we have kind of three big core businesses that what we call our individual retail products, life, annuity, individual annuities, individual disability income. And part of that is our wealth management with our broker dealer and registered investment advisor on the investment side. And then we have uh, group ancillary benefits which is kind of a total diversifier from the individual retail side. And there we have group uh, and individual dental vision and hearing. And then we have our retirement plan business, which I mentioned 401ks, 457s, MEPs and PEPs and all sorts of interesting acronyms. Um, so those are our three core businesses. And uh, you'll note in our, in our, name Emeritus Life Insurance Corp. Life insurance is our is our core. It is where most of our, or the majority of our capital is deployed. And as a mutual based organization, um, with the exodus of many of the uh, life insurance companies, many of them are stock companies with their inability to generate uh, market like uh, ROEs that satisfy shareholders, they've exited life insurance. And as a, as a mutual based company, we're able to take a very long term view. And I believe that life insurance, even though it hasn't earned its cost of capital the last few years in the ultra low interest rate environment, will be an acceptable uh, return business going forward. And so we're we're continuing to focus on on life insurance as a company, as a mutual based company with a long, longer time horizon than most companies, and that that's our core business. Annuities uh, supports that supports our distribution partners, and then we have kind of this unique business, individual disability income, which takes a, a real uh, real specialized a focus and, and knowledge of to, to be able to withstand the volatility and individual disability income, a little bit different than group uh, DI. So those are our cores there, along, our core businesses along with wealth management. And then uh, group dental is a core business. We're one of the top companies there. 
nationwide. It's a very nice business. It's capital light. So a lot of a lot of those people that are exiting life insurance are getting into the ancillary benefits business, capital light businesses. And so we're seeing more more competition there. But uh, we're we have a really good solid uh, position in that uh, in that space. And then retirement plans, uh, we're we are uh, we could use more scale in retirement plans, and we've done a couple of acquisitions there over the last uh, several years, continuing to uh, grow both organically and inorganically. But I consider that to be a core business that fits very well with uh, with the uh, business of Emeritus, those three businesses. So we're diversified on purpose, like uh, like uh, given the fact that I, I've primarily been, uh, I spent 26 years on the investment side. Diversification is really the only free lunch, provides you with uh, longer term stability. So Bill, we recently had the CEO of Legal and General on, and they're unique in that they're almost exclusively focused on term life insurance and you have the strategy that, you know, um, great focus allows you to build a dominant market share position and be the best in something that is atypical in life insurance or in insurance. Typically you want often diversify products and services to amortize your team and all the capabilities that you've built. How do you think about this and your strategy of diversification? Yeah, it, it is a difficult uh, business model to be as diversified as Emeritus is. And um, and you need this, you know, it's a fiercely competitive industry of every, we fight for every basis point. And um, a lot of, a lot of our peers and our competition are, are, kind of rationalizing their product portfolios and their businesses. And uh, we we see that as a viable business strategy, but one that we we think that uh, the diversification provides more or better long-term benefits to the to the organization. And we feel in in our spaces that we can be competitive. Now we're, you know, in life insurance like uh, IUL, we're in the top 20 as a competitor and, and we're uh, kind of rapidly moving down the the uh, the league tables, I guess is what I'll call it. That's what we call it on the investment side. So we're making, we're taking market share away in life insurance by having a really solid uh, good business or good products as well as uh, enhancing our distribution systems on a on an appropriate basis but it is difficult um, but it's it's the business is too volatile in my opinion to be only in one line of business at, at our size of an organization so we're we're trying to build out each of our three major business lines. And within within those business lines, be diversified by product, as well as by distribution system. It's complex. Uh, it's a, little, a, a lot more work to do it that way, but I I think it creates a, a smoother future for Emeritus and w- one where we think we can uh, earn a fair return for the members of the organization. You know, if I just take retirement plans, um, or we show up kind of around that 20th or so number in terms of uh, our assets under management. But uh, you know, we're, we're not going head to head in the large, the large plans. That, that is just a, a recipe for uh, lost uh, profits. We, we, we focus in, uh, niches or in spaces where we can be a, 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 a strong industry competitor where there's enough margin to survive in, in the business. Um, 
And uh, we're, we're very good at kind of packaging things into the multiple employer pl plans so that small employers can have competitive retirement plan offerings, which they didn't really have those options uh, prior to the SECURE 2.0 Act being in place. So we, we think um, we think we're in good segments of these big businesses. Uh, where we can be competitive. Um, we also uh, strongly believe that in the spaces that we're in, that they'll continue, we'll continue to have an intermediary that will help customize the solutions for customers. You, know, uh, you mentioned legal in general, so I'll mention them. They're, they're, uh, you know, they're a super competitive player in that term space, and they. They uh, do a great job there, but um, it's it's that is not our market per se. You know, well, we create uh, interesting and unique uh, products in the term space. Most of them are convertible into to permanent uh, products. Ultimately, over time, as as we can kind of continue to follow the customer's life journey. Where where their needs change, but um, we're co we're comfortable with this diversification that we have and the profitability around each of our businesses and the growth that we're experiencing and and all of them. Somebody somebody will ask me, well, how do you measure what what success is? And I'll I'll say, well, it depends on whether we're winning or not, and because everybody wants to be on the winning team. Well, what does that mean? It means to me that we're taking market share away from our these fierce competitors that we have that we're, we're creating profitable long-term growth, taking market share and creating our own scale in a sense at Emeritus. And, you know, insurance is often perceived as a commoditized product. You're, you have a price per unit for a contract of coverage. And when you think about non-acquisitive growth, and profitable growth, as you described it, how, how do you become a winner in that market? Is it innovating in product design? Is it finding dislocations and inefficiencies in the market? You know, if everyone has a, a similar cost of capital and a, you know, and somewhat similar underwriting strategies, how do you, how do you win in this market? Yeah, it's uh, an interesting question, especially with some of the monsters that are out there that have uh, kind of a competitive advantage in the cost of capital, I think. Um, well, you know, some products are, are simpler than others, and they probably lend themselves to more commoditization. Uh, the more complex solutions like those that we offer, um, that's our target market. Uh, this is where this is where we believe we can differentiate ourselves. And uh, so we look to have a really fresh uh, shelf of products out there that are unique and uh, valuable to customers, as well as um, growing our distribution systems at the same time. So we're looking, we're constantly looking for more uh, relationship and uh, relationships and distribution partners and in, in the marketplace we've been I, I would say extremely successful at this since 2017 once we kind of uh, put a, a little bit of a different strategy in place one having competitive products two growing our distribution systems and then three trying to uh, improve the the way that we do business and the processes, processes of the company, the digital interactions, the automated or accelerated underwriting and, and understanding the lifelong journey of our customers. So um, that's that's really where we're at. And I, I, I just simply measure it by, are we taking market share or not away from who I consider to be probably one of the best competitive industries that exist today are uh, there are not very many dislocations or inefficiencies in, in the market in which we operate they're incredibly incredibly good uh, 
companies that are well managed, that are that have that are well capitalized. Um, so it's it's not those uh, inefficiencies that are going to keep you in business. It's basic. Uh, blocking and tackling of product and distribution systems, and that's where we that's where we focus and where I think we excel in all of our businesses. So, on the second point of distribution systems, when you think about winning with distributors today, especially in independent distribution, what is required to succeed? Yeah, our uh, you know you have. We're in this middle of this kind of major transformation with respect to our technology. We're, I, I think we're changing out every major process and every major system in our company while we're continuing to compete in the, in the marketplace. So I really believe that technology is uh, critical and uh, a company like Emeritus, that's well capitalized, that's profitable, that manages its business well. We're we're just pouring we're pouring money into transforming the organization to be more g- digitally enabled. You know, we're look we're a di- data rich uh, industry. We haven't taken advantage of it. We need to get our data organized, logical, indexed, and and uh, start managing it more efficiently and effectively. So that's the journey we're on, on, on that side. And we need, we need to make it super easy to do business with uh, Emeritus from a distribution partner's perspective and from a customer's perspective. We have made uh, tremendous strides in that regard just over the pandemic because everyone realized it was, you know, you had to, you had to transform or you were going to die when uh, people were not getting together. So that's a big part of it. Um, but our secret sauce really still does continue to be the the relationships that we have our distribution with our distribution partners, the, the different diversified distribution systems that we have. We go all the way from kind of the more traditional uh, general agent kind of quasi um, captive agency all the way to the independent distribution partner. And now, you know, with these relationships like we have with Ethos, we're trying to learn uh, how to uh, penetrate into uh, these different market spaces and uh, be successful in those spaces as we learn about uh, the differences that are there. And they're, they're, they're meaningful, significant. And when you think about the next 10 years, what uh, product categories are you most excited about high rates of growth in? Like, where do you think, you know, your future will expand the most into naturally? Yeah, I don't, um, I don't, I, the next 10 years, I, I think it's going to be all about this technology revolution that we're experiencing and, and the, the management of data and uh, the customization of solutions that will be taking place. Um, I, as I mentioned, we we continue to believe that there there will be intermediaries in some role going forward. It'll be different than what it is today because I think we'll provide more of the decision making and the automation, but that customized solution will still come from these uh, distribution partners and the experts. They still need to touch base with the, the customer and figure out what their what their needs are. So I don't, I don't we're, we're betting that that's not gonna change and uh, we'll, we'll be more digitally enabled as an, as an industry and as a company going forward. Um, so let's talk about your leadership. Um, first off, Emeritas has an excellent culture, and you your described purpose is helping people live a fulfilling life. How do you build an amazing culture and keep your team members very motivated and excited to come and do what they do on a daily basis and process through 
all the challenges of low interest rate environments, COVID, uh, you know, overcoming technology hurdles, ingesting acquisitions, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question and and uh, very timely. Talent, talent has been a challenge for sure in this environment. I, I think for everyone, it's been a challenge. Um, a lot, lots of uh, lots of change out there. We've we've done a lot of everything to try and figure out what the right environment should be for our associates. And like I said, we we're uh, mentioned to you earlier that we're kind of in the pro process of completely remodeling our home office building in Lincoln, Nebraska, to create it to to support this hybrid workforce strategy that we have. The networking that needs to take place, the you know less than five days a week uh, workforce strategy. Um, in addition to just kind of where uh, where the markets are at, so it's been a it's been a big workforce change, and um, one one that I I think is still a little bit of an experiment as we're as we're going forward, uh, but we do. Uh, you know, we do some really incredible things. I think we we encourage our associates to understand our 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 purpose, our mission, our vision, and our values, and we talk about it constantly. Um, we we let them know, you know, about the kind of the stories of our customers and the differences they're making in people's lives. So we talk about these things that we're actually doing as a company with our associates. We we encourage our associates to be lifelong learners and to pursue, pursue growth and development. Um, we it, It's very satisfying to me when I see somebody moving up in the organization. We're, we're not going to do a forum, but we sure are going to give them the opportunity to take advantage of, of uh, growth and opportunity. And one of the ways that that we can do that is that we continue to outperform the industry, take market a share away and grow as a company that creates opportunities. Like I said, Emeritus has grown tremendously over the last four decades. Well, it, 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 that created opportunity for me, that growth to fill in, to take on new responsibilities, to do new and different things, to expand and, and to grow. And so, we have to have that vision of growth in the organization. And I think that creates the opportunity that's really unbelievable for our associates. So we uh, we do uh, things like we encourage them to get involved in the communities in which we operate. We actually uh, give them paid time off to do that, um, to go volunteer at a not-for-profit, to get in, engaged, involved, to, to be out there making a difference where, wherever they live. And uh, that's that's a pretty important thing we found in, in terms of uh, creating a purpose for our associates. Um, you know, I think um, with our associates, you build trust by our actions. And, um, and so we try really, really try and uh, walk the walk here from the top down. And uh, that's, that's why I believe in growth so much as an organization. Like I said, people get really tired of me talking about it, but uh, it's it's not for selfish reasons. It's not it's not because I want to be a Fortune 100 company. It's not because I want to be bigger. It's because I want to create opportunities for people. It, either they can take them professionally or personally, whatever whatever their goals are individually. I, I want to be able to put them in a position where they can capitalize on on that uh, those opportunities, and the only way I can do that is to force growth in, into emeritus so that there's more space for them to take on more accountability and more responsibility and to to grow along with the company. It may not be obvious on a day to day basis, but um, it happens over time. Right. When an organization is growing or evolving, it's not a zero-sum game for someone to advance in their career. 
Um, there are different right. opportunities across the company. So Bill, can you give our listeners a, uh, view into what the daily life of a top life insurance company CEOs, you know, a day is like, how do you manage the business? What does your average day look like? Average day? Well, I don't know if there is anything that's normal or average anymore. I, I would say it's um, a day filled with meetings, of, uh, primarily of, of uh, those that report to me in terms of leadership positions, just uh, providing guidance and uh, advice and uh, watching watching them grow. So it's a lot of uh, a lot of one on one meetings. A lot of walking around the the organization, trying to let people know that uh, that we're doing fine, and then uh, oh my God, a tremendous amount of emails every day. Try and <laughs> I do try and stay up on uh, emails, even though uh, you know those that are not necessary get <clears throat> kind of filtered out. But it's still several hundred emails a day that I I try and respond to, and I and I do pick up my phone directly if people call me. So I had uh, I had one of our 40-year uh, veterans in, uh, on the distribution side in Pennsylvania call yesterday, and I picked up my phone, and he's like, oh, my God, I didn't expect you to answer the phone. <laughs> and I said, well, why did you call me then? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't expect me to answer. So I, I uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm not scared of having those conversations on a day-to-day -day basis. He had some good news for me, so that was fun. And um, how, how would your team describe your management style? I'm not sure. I I, uh, I try and be uh, transparent. Uh, I try and uh, make sure that everyone is uh, uh, has an opportunity for a voice. They may not get a vote. But they'll have a voice, and I, I definitely would consider myself to be someone that listens before before I make a decision. But you know, it gets harder and harder as you uh, move up and kind of higher in the pyramid to uh, to listen to everything, and it gets harder and harder to get everybody's input. Sometimes you just have to make a decision and. And move forward and live with the results and hope hopefully you're right most of the time but uh, i would say it's inclusive it's transparent hopefully they think i'm encouraging and uh at times i i can be tough on them if i feel it's necessary so um we ask this question to everyone we're in a business with no north star metric and you have to consider growth placement rates, uh, approval rates, persistency, mortality, interest rates, commission rates, long-term profitability, short-term profitability. How do you balance all of these counter metrics while still growing and moving quickly? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really great question. And one that we debate constantly. We, we had this debate about what is our what is our north star, what is our apex goal, and of course, every time it comes back to the customer, are we delivering valuable products to our customers, and are they taking advantage of the benefits that we're creating for them? And I, I say every every year that that percentage of benefits, interest that's credited, or uh, mortality benefits, or just uh, um, or disability benefits, uh, retirement income payments, all those are they're growing every year. So I I use that kind of as our north star. Whether we're uh, you know meeting the needs, fulfilling the life of our customers, uh, more directly um, it comes comes down to me: are we, are we taking market share away from our competition? Uh, do we have uh, better growth rates? than uh, those that we're competing against, it's critical. And then what is that profit component for, for against our peers? 
our uh, our ROE against our peers. That as a as a mutual based organization, you know, our our profit goals are different than a stock based organization. We don't have to uh, we don't have to feed the the shareholders right some special return above what the return is fair and required for our for our members. Uh, members just want to make sure that we're safe and secure and are able to deliver on the promises longer term. So a little different dynamic. So we measure ourselves against other mutual based organizations on a ROE basis. Makes sense. Yeah, there's a million different uh, measures and, and we pay attention to all of them. Persistency and growth and benefits and interest rates and equity markets and just it's an, an incredible plethora of different data sets that we have to watch. Yeah. It's a very intellectually interesting career in industry. You are always learning and it never gets old, um, in my opinion. Um, so four quick questions for our listeners to get to know you. Um, what's your favorite place to vacation? Uh, my wife and I have a place uh, in Colorado in the in the mountains, about uh, nine thousand feet altitude, and we go up there and we uh, ride our bikes, go for walks, and and play golf in uh, the crisp, cool air of of Colorado. It's a beautiful place. Um, what's yeah. your favorite sport to play or watch? Oh, that's a, that's a really hard one. Ha having just come off a disappointing uh, bracket in uh, NCAA uh, basketball. But uh, um, I think my favorite uh, sport to watch is football. Go Huskers. Uh, you know, the, the Huskers one, even though we haven't been relevant in 20 years, we'll be back someday. And then uh, uh, my family is a big uh, Kansas City Chiefs fan fans. So we have season tickets to the Chiefs and season tickets to the Huskers and couldn't have more fun with uh, uh, both of those teams. What's the last topic that you went really deep on learning that didn't have anything to do with work? Didn't have anything to, oh my gosh, that's such a great question. Uh, went really deep on um Gosh, I don't know. I don't know. I have to think about that one. Okay. I don't next. know if I have. I don't know if I have time for uh, going really deep on anything other than uh, insurance. I'm not sure, you, Peter. You need some hobbies, Bill. Um, and then, lastly, what's <laughs> the last? What's the last book you read? Oh, I'll give you a couple of them because um, they're they're kind of 180 degrees apart. So. Uh, the last uh, 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 real history book that I just finished was Lincoln uh, on the Verge. It was after he had been elected president, had to make the uh, the trip from Springfield to uh, Washington, D.C., and it was fraught with uh, danger and, uh, and planning. It was a relatively short trip, but... Uh, uh, a very intriguing and, uh, you know, the divisiveness of the country at that point, kind of a little bit uh, some of the similarities to the polarization of today and uh, the decisions that Lincoln was made. I've, um, I'm a bit of a Lincoln scholar and have followed him. So that was a, a recent book. And then one for fun, I read The Boys of Biloxi. It's a, it's a fiction uh, about the... Uh, uh, Mississippi coast, uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, and, and the underground and the mob and how they control mm. the casinos and, and the underworld. Uh, very enjoyable, kind of hard to put that one down. Uh, so to totally different spectrums. On the Lincoln book, we were so fortunate at that time to have a president who was very focused on uniting the country through the yeah. most de divisive conditions and scenarios. And I hope that that spirit of leadership comes back. Yeah, the, the the strength and the fortitude that he had and the vision that he had to keep the country together was when, enormous. When all of his advisors were 
saying, allow this out to secede and just let it, yeah. you know, let the bloodshed end and yeah. the incredible personal strength. Yeah. So, well, Bill, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been an absolute pleasure to learn more about you for our listeners. Hopefully everyone enjoyed that session and, um, Thank you so much, and we will see everyone next time. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate, the, appreciate this, appreciate the time. My last advice is take the time to make yourself better every day. It might not be obvious every day, but over time, it will make a big difference in your lives. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Peter. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me for this episode of What's Your Ethos? If you're interested in helping to protect the next million families, come join us. You can learn more about ethos at ethoslife.com. I'll see you next time.